Hi, so uh, for anybody who's randomly browsing onto this uh, video, this is going to be roughly a 30 minute discussion about some of the stuff involved in Feynman's thesis, A New Approach to Quantum Theory. And it's being done for a live journal discussion group. There will be more info like over there-ish or so, so click links over there. And, uh, and uh, the discussion group exists to, you know, answer questions and stuff like that. So this covers things that I think might be unclear. Uh, well, you're, for the people in the group, supposedly you've already read through the preface, the introduction. Uh, I expect to go through, uh, Feynman has parts, you know, part one in Roman numerals is the introduction. And then part two has several subsections. Section one defines functionals. Section 2 deals with least action principles. Uh, section 3 basically derives Noether's theorem, uh, named for Emmy Noether. And uh, everybody should have a derivation, you know, in their mind of Noether's theorem, and Feynman's is pretty fine. Uh, not to make a pun. Um, so that's as far as I'm getting. I know that section 2, uh, part 2, section 4 is actually very interesting. But I figured I'd skip it because this was getting long enough. Uh, what I wanted to do was, I don't really have any special comments on either the preface or the introduction. Feynman has this way of uh, linking things together. Uh, mentioning something in very brief detail and talking about how you can do stuff with this, but then not do it going into details with it. And I think you see that very clearly in the introduction. I am not going to uh, cover any of that unless I'm actually, uh, you know, asked a specific question about it. I just feel that that's, you know, more expedient to the group. I am going, there haven't been any questions, so I'm going to cover two ideas. One is to derive the least action law from Newton's laws, uh, just to show how it's done. And the second will be to do a specific example of what Feynman is talking about in Part 2, Section 3. Uh, just to illuminate some of the specific stuff involved in it. So, what I'm doing right now is deriving the least action principle. And uh, I am told that the history of this principle involves solving situations where Newton's law ma is the sum of forces, degenerates into a very easy, a very easy potential function force that you can just work with with no problems whatsoever, uh, plus a constraint force that is very, very annoying. And what do I mean by constraint forces are annoying? Uh, if you think about pendulums, or even double pendulums, uh, there are constraints that uh, a force acts perpendicularly to the spherical surface on which the pendulum swings. And it, uh, well, it keeps it on the sphere. And then there, for the double pendulum, there's another, another uh, link, and then another constraint force keeps it on a sphere relative to that uh, pivot point. Uh, that sort of stuff is very, very hard to work with in, in practice. I'll just give you an example of a problem called the Brachistochrone problem. The Brachistochrone problem goes like this. You've got a starting point, an ending point. It's got a Greek name, I don't know why. But you've got a starting point, an ending point. You're trying to design a roller coaster, entirely gravity fed, no extra pushes or anything like that, that gets from point A to point B in the least time. And, uh, Except for a couple of paths, the constraint forces on this are relatively complicated. There is one path which, where they are simple. It goes like this, straight shot from A to B. Uh, assuming A and B are at the same height, which is the simplest form of the Brachistochrone problem, this path doesn't actually work, right? Because it, it just doesn't. You don't get any forward speed. and. The closer you get to this path, uh, t goes to infinity, the time that you take goes to infinity. 
Uh, but the constraint forces are relatively, you know, they're uniform along the whole thing. You know that they are always equal to m times g. Um, so you know the constraint forces very, very well. Another path that you might take goes down like this. Very sharp corner here. Across like this. Very sharp corner here. Up like that. And uh, here you're basically just free falling. I mean, you are on a roller coaster track. You are constrained to stay on that roller coaster track. Uh, but it doesn't actually have an effect you are basically just free falling. And so the constraint force on here is no constraint force. The constraint force at this pivot, well, it's big and complicated, right? But you can just use conservation of energy. As long as this is a very, very small, uh, small section of the track, you don't need to worry about how much time it takes to go through that part of the track. And so the constraint forces here, you don't actually need to worry about. Constraint forces here are mg or less if you get very, very deep into the Earth's surface. Here, conservation of energy again. Here, reverse free fall again, no force. Well, gravity, but no constraint force. Um, so that's an example of a problem in which... Uh, it's an example of the Brachistochrone problem in which constraint forces can be a real bitch. Because, well, this first off tends to be inefficient. And the reason why it tends to be inefficient is eventually you make this thing very, very deep, right? Uh, you uh, drop this distance, the time it takes to clear this distance, to zero. You know, you're going very, very fast and no matter how long it goes, you can speed yourself up in the absence of wind resistance, uh, so that you just cross it in a millisecond or less. Practically zero. And then what happens when you make it deeper and deeper and deeper is just you free fall longer and longer. So as you make that deeper and deeper, uh, time goes to infinity. There's sort of an ideal path which goes like that. Uh, but the constraint forces along here, right, are always very, very wacky. They point perpendicular to the direction of this thing. They have a magnitude. You can't necessarily figure out the magnitude because it's accelerating downwards a little bit uh, as it goes down. And so uh, you can't say something like the y component is equal to mg because it's not necessarily. Stuff like that. Very, very complicated and gets a lot of its complications from the fact that vectors have direction. And so the individual components may have a very complicated relationship between them. Uh, in addition, you don't know what form you are looking for. So there is nothing... Well, there's physics stopping the ideal form from being that way. But there's no way to know that the form isn't that way a priori. Um, not without doing the physics, I mean. So... That's the Brachistochrone problem. I am now going to erase it because it doesn't... It's just an example of a situation why constraint forces would be annoying. And uh, the way that this whole shindig works, the new strategy that Feynman is talking about, basically involves... I mean, you're taking derivatives, of functional derivatives and stuff like that. But what it boils down to is you have a trajectory R of T. I'll call it R of T. You've got a trajectory which I'm calling R of T, which is the path that it actually takes. On that path, these equations hold. Uh, but we don't need to necessarily follow that path. We can also ask what happens on a different path which the particle would not take if you just let the particle do what you wanted. Do what it wanted. So, that I'm going to call delta r of t. Or rather, I'm going to perturb this path by that amount. 